Hi, and welcome to our discussion of Twin Peaks Season 1, the final episode entitled The Last Evening. So as always, uh, we'll give you some brief impressions, and then we'll follow that up with a longer, spoiler-filled discussion. Uh, so what did you think of this this final episode? So episode? much happened in this episode. Yeah. And it really and it ends on a total cl cliffhanger in, in a lot of ways. Basically, right. every storyline has some sort of a cliffhanger. Right. Um, so it's definitely got to be an A. It sets it up perfectly for the second season. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I would give this one an A. A lot happened in this. All the subplots got advanced. There were a couple of elements that were a little cheesy. I know that in the original run, a lot of fans were kind of upset or disappointed that we didn't learn who killed Laura Palmer. That was the point of the first season. Um, in a lot of ways, the way that it was marketed. Um, but we don't find out who Laura's killer was here. Uh, no. I mean, the presumption is that we have resolution on it, at least. Uh, what we find out, you know, the end of the last episode, we had, uh, Maddie in the park at the gazebo, yeah. uh, with someone watching her. Um, we, we get, at the beginning of this episode, we get Dr. Jacoby, um, who sees her in the park, is kind of, you know, stunned that it's her. Right. Uh, and as he's about to kind of head her direction, he's attacked from behind, beaten pretty soundly, um, and has a heart attack. Uh, yeah. and, but the person who attacked him is wearing a, a ski mask, and we have no idea who it was. Right. Um, what we do, you know, then see is uh, her getting into the car with, uh, with Donna, uh, James heading out, uh, and, you know... Sure, and the the resolution to that plot line is that, of course, they listen to the tape. It's you know fairly humiliating for mm -hmm. James, but they all learn a bit more about Laura and her her secret side, her kind of dark side. They end up turning that tape over to the police, of course, but in doing so, Bobby has set James up. Yeah, what I thought was interesting when they were listening to the tape is that you know Laura saying that uh, James was so boring and dumb, like. Uh, right. That that gave him license that it was like okay for him to be with Donna because sure because sure. Laura didn't really want to be with him anyway. Right, right. <laughs> that's. That's definitely true. But she does reveal in the tape, as we already know, because we've are actually we may not know this, um, because at some point uh, when Jacoby's listening to it, he puts the headphones back on, so we don't actually hear everything that Laura says. Yeah. Um, this is maybe the first time that we hear Laura saying that, like, oh, he's got a red Corvette and he's coming to pick me up. I gotta go. Yeah, and it, and it's interesting because we've seen three characters who have red Corvettes. I mean, Jacoby himself has mm -hmm. one. Her father has one. And Leo has one. Yeah. But the implication is that it's Leo. I think the assumption that everybody has at this so. point is that it's Leo. I mean, it was Leo and Jacques with her in the in the cabin. Um, once they arrest Jacques, uh, he reveals, well, even before that, he reveals that, that yeah. that's where they were. Um, and that there was some, some, you know... Yeah, sure. They were tied up for, for sexual purposes. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, so maybe that leads us into what was going on at One Eye Jacks. I mean, so we've got the tail end of the, the kind of undercover sting operation mm -hmm. there. Um, Cooper makes contact with, with Jacques, um, ends up setting him up to go back across the border and get arrested. Um, that was pretty satisfying because, of course, Jacques pulled another deputy's gun and Andy very coolly... Uh, shoots him, which which was nice. All of his hard work at target practice has yes. totally paid off. Yes, though, you know, back at the station, he did not react as Lucy wanted him to when she revealed that she was pregnant. Yeah, I mean, she really, you know, she was really excited that he was now the hero, and then she reveals that she's pregnant, right. and he is just, like, stunned into silence. Sure. She's pissed off. He walks away. Everybody, all of the guys in the lobby are just like, what the heck happened? Right, and, right. Yeah. Well, and and so in because of that conversation between Cooper and Jacques, I mean, we get some of these blanks filled in, as you alluded to. I mean, mm -hmm. Jacques kind of walks us through what, what was going on. But then, you know, part of this story that, that Jacques tells is that, um, you know, he got kind of, passed out drunk, you know, he was... And cold-cocked by Leo. Cold-cocked by, by Leo, um, you know, kind of crawled outside licking his wounds, and then when he comes to, Leo and the girls are gone. Yes. So, you know, we don't have 
perfect resolution on exactly what happened. I mm -hmm. mean, basically, Ronette's in a coma, Lara's dead, Leo is really the only one who knows what happened and, mm -hmm. and how they got up to the train car and then what happened after that. Yeah, and, and, and that's not filled in at all. Right. Um, one of the other storylines that we have here is uh, the situation with Catherine Martell. Sure. Um, life insurance policy. Um, she's trying to reconcile with her husband because she knows she's pretty screwed here. Yeah, I don't think it's a sincere reconciliation. No. I think she knows that she can trust Pete if she can convince him to get back on her side. Yeah. He falls for it hook, line, and sinker, even risking his own life sure. by the end of the episode on her behalf. Um, but yeah, I mean, so Catherine um is it, it's it's kind of interesting because you know this storyline is very much tied in with hank and leo because mm -hmm. you know leo by this point despite the police surveillance on his house i think that's a bit of a plot hole here yeah um because supposedly his house was under surveillance or maybe, maybe slip past just an indication of how craptastic the sure. police are in twin peaks and that's but that's believable lovable too. but maybe not terribly effective sure so you know he He's able to, to snatch Shelly, drag her out to this, this lumber drying um, building and, you know, sets up a, a, a timer and an explosive to burn the place down as... Blaming her for all of it. You've made me right, do this. I'm right. not, you're making me kill you like every right. good abuser does. Sure, sure, of course. Um, but Hank sabotages that because he has <laughs> he has Catherine go out to that building. Um, she discovers Shelly there. She doesn't know who Shelly is. And, you know, it was very telling about Catherine because she very reluctantly kind of saves Shelly's life. Yeah, I mean, she's just this awful person. Right. She goes in and, and Shelly is bound and gagged. Right. And Shelly's trying to, like, point her in the direction of the timer that's right. about to go off right. and burn everything. And she says, girl, I can't understand a word you're saying with that thing in your mouth. Right. It's like, right. well, then take it out of her mouth, lady. Yeah, like yeah. But, of course, so Catherine does rescue Shelly and you know our last image of them is as they're escaping from the building theoretically sure so I mean we as viewers know that they're escaping from the building nobody yeah. else knows first of all that right. Shelly was even in the building right. and second of all that Catherine got out because sure. when when um when her husband arrives when Pete yeah. arrives like the car is there, sure. and he, you know, rushes in to try and save her. Yeah, I mean, Pete's a really sad character, but, you know, he's actually a, a heroic guy in love with his, his wife, as it turns out. So um, that, too, is a kind of cliffhanger. Pete's a minor character. I, I like him, and um, so... You know, that that's kind of a, an interesting moment. And you can tell, I mean, because of the music, I mean, there are certain, like, musical overtures yeah. that happen in certain places. And, and the, the theme music often happens when you have a couple coming together in, like, a, a loving kind of situation. Yeah. And I think we, we saw that with Donna and James in this episode. And mm -hmm. we, we saw that with uh, with Pete and, and Catherine yeah, here, sure. too, that that music was playing as they're kind of semi-reconciling. At least, you know, for Pete's feelings about it. Yeah, at least on his side. Yeah. yeah. But then we also have Hank. Sure. You know, Hank is, you know, trying to reconcile in some way, in a really sleazy way, with uh, with his wife. Yeah. But then also, you know, there's there's some background history that he has with Josie. Um, he, he doesn't come out and say it. He alludes to it a yeah. lot. Uh, he's trying to blackmail her for some more money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important that, that we talk about that because, you know, the implication here is, I, I thought very clearly that Josie paid Hank to uh, kill her, her husband. Even though, even though Josie earlier had been saying, like, I think somebody, you know, killed him. And well, I think she, right. at that point she was trying to, you know, pin it on somebody else. Um, Possible. Possibly. Yeah. Or at least, you know, kind of win Truman to her side. Sure. I mean, we, we get more in the second season uh, sure. about it. Sure. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, so he's not content with the 90 grand that yeah. she's promised him. He had to um, s s spend 18 months of his life, um, you know, copying to this kind of manslaughter charge for an unrelated, unrelated crime so that he wasn't going to get implicated in that murder or some other crime. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Hank's an interesting kind of wild card in all of this because he ruins Leo's plans to kill Shelley. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we should mention that in 
Um, the confrontation back at Leo and Shelley's place, he is lurking there, waiting. Bobby pops up. He's about to kill Bobby. And then Hank shoots him. Yeah. So we have a lot of deaths or near deaths or potential yeah. deaths right. in this episode. Right. Um, so the first, I, we'll just say the first death right now is Leo, uh, or at least what we think he's dying. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we have a mirroring of his death in the, the soap television soap opera. Right. So, uh, Montana I think, is shot by, by Chet. Yeah. So I think the, the assumption is Leo is, is likewise dead. Um, we have Jacques being killed. Um, right. Leland Palmer goes to the police station, wants to know who has, if they've caught the killer, the, yeah. the, the, um, nope, they can, all they can say is, you know, it's an active investigation. We can't tell you anymore. Right. We don't know right. anything for sure. Um, but you know, the doctor has just come from the hospital. Sure. And so, sure. uh, what we see is Leland Palmer going to the hospital and, taping up Jacques's hand to to the side of the bed and smothering him with a pillow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because it's the action of an aggrieved father um, who... You can read it that way. Yeah, yes. yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is somebody who he, he asks, uh, okay, so I've heard that you've caught the guy. Mm -hmm. um, they refuse to say more. And so, um, you know, he smothers... Um, uh, the man who he believes, you know, killed his daughter. But, of course, we're going to need to return to this scene yeah. uh, when we get to season two because uh, this is actually a pretty pivotal scene Yeah, we're gonna uh, have with to, a lot of implications. We're going to have to return to Leland Palmer's actions in the entire first season yeah, uh, sure. in light of what happens in the second season. Uh, sure. You know, we have to question every decision, everything that he says sure. in the first season in light of what we find out in the second season. Yeah. Yeah, so just follow that away for now. I mean, because this is not at all inconsistent with what we can imagine uh, a pretty traumatized, grieving father would behave mm -hmm. like, um, you know, willing to commit an act of violence to avenge his sure. daughter. Um, but we'll we'll re return to this. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got those two deaths. Then uh, we have uh, we have Catherine, who who people think might possibly be dead. Sure. We've got Pete, who's run into the building. Right. We don't know what's going to happen with him. And before we go any further, let's let's revisit One-Eyed Jacks. Yeah, so, I mean, the other person who we left there was Audrey, her first night as a hospitality girl. And Ben Horn with the Icelanders. Right, so um, they do finally sign the Ghostwood deal. And by the way, we, you know, we should mention this, this Ghostwood development in Country Club. Mm -hmm. um, the name Ghostwood is absolutely perfect because, of course, we already know from the Bookhouse Boys that the woods, uh, well, and the Log Lady, the woods around um, Twin Peaks are, if not actually haunted, I mean, there's a kind of dark presence there, sure. a kind of evil um, that's lurking there in the in the woods all around Twin Peaks. And so I think that this, this ghost wood name is definitely a reflection of that. I mean, there, that's no coincidence. And there are also a lot of people who have been killed in service of creating this, uh, this property. Leo dies, sure. possibly Catherine, sure. a handful, uh, probably Andrew as well. Sure. You know, all of these people have died in service of creating this. Right. Right. That, that's very true. Yeah. So as a celebration of the signing of the documents to create the ghost wood, right property he decides that he wants to go visit the new girl yeah i mean it, it's a great scene because i mean audrey doesn't actually know who the owner of one eye jacks is yet she mm -hmm. inquires she's told no names um and then of course she sees dear old dad in a mirror i thought that scene was that, that shot was so interesting because you know, we talked about this kind of mirroring and doubling through the whole first mm -hmm. season, and then this what you get is her as the as the queen of diamonds. Yeah. You know, she's got that card kind of sewn onto her with some like little little seamstress lady. The great around. little hunchback seamstress. <laughs> I think we see her again in the second season. We may, if I recall correctly. Um, but again, the the queen, the all of the face cards are mirror images of one yeah. another. Um, and then she's sitting on the chair, not facing the door, but facing this mirror. And in the mirror, she sees her father come into the room. And the look on her face, I remember watching this, and I remember yeah. watching the, the subsequent episodes in, se in season two, where she's, like, trying to avoid being seen by her father. And it's just, it's it's hilarious 
serious, but also right. so tragic. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> and of course, we're left with that. I yeah. Mean, that's how this this subplot ends. That's it's how that serious. subplot ends. Yeah. But the other way that it ends, and the actual like ending of the finale. Oh, and actually, before we get to that, we should mention one more potential death, which we haven't said anything about. And that's when Big Ed returns home. <gasps> oh, he yes. comes home to find that Nadine has taken... Um, quite a lot of pills. Yes, and left him a note, and he calls the the yeah. ambulance to come yeah, pick them sure. up. Oh gosh, yeah, that was awful. Yeah, I mean, you know, Nadine has had her heart broken. It, it was it was raised by this idea of an invention that was going to bring wealth and and happiness, and then it's crushed by the uncaring patent attorney in the next town over. Um, and her knowledge that. Like, Norma really is the love of his life. Yeah, I mean, it's not as though there were any great revelations no. for Nadine. She didn't walk in on them or anything like that. But I, I agree with you. I mean, on some level, she knows or strongly suspects that Ed's heart belongs to Norma. Yeah. Okay. Back to the very end of the finale. Yeah. Agent Cooper arrives back. It's silent. Blissfully silent because the Icelanders are up in Canada with... Yeah. Gambling and whores. Uh, sex workers, sorry. Uh, and then we have, uh, he answers the phone. It's kind of shaky. We can't understand what's, ha what, what's being said. He sets the phone down because he assumes room service is there with his warm milk so that he can get some sleep. Um, then we hear on the phone Andy telling him that Leo has been shot. Mm -hmm. As he's opening the door, we see... A cloaked figure wearing black. Right. Not the face at all, just the gun. And then we see several shots being fired into his tuxedo shirt. Yeah, I mean, it's that's a pretty sad ending because, of course, when he walked in, he also came in to find that Audrey had left him a note as yes. well, addressed to my secret agent. We don't we don't know what the contents of that note were. Um, yeah, so this is probably the ultimate cliffhanger. Ugh, yes. Um, I mean, so not only do we not yet know who killed Laura Palmer, but our hero, Dale Cooper, is quite possibly dead, or at least we have to assume that he's pretty badly hurt. And in 1990, this is how season season one ended. Yeah. On well, an absolute cliffhanger with no resolution as to who actually killed Laura Palmer. Long summer and uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of disappointments, I think, for a lot of fans um, in terms of having to wait until the fall season. But it built up anticipation sure, for the course. second season. Um, and we're just as excited to do our reviews of each of the episodes in the second season, too. Absolutely. So we're, we're going to press on. And um, this is all leading up to season three because, of course, we've had a 25-year-long uh, hiatus. So we probably won't finish our reviews before uh, Season 3 starts. We'll probably release them uh, simultaneous yeah. with some of the Season 3 reviews. But we will do a five-minute what you need to know before Season 3 starts. Before Season 3 starts. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.